Hey everyone, welcome to the next installment of our rare breed study, which is basically what it's turned into. So today, crinkly paper, <clears throat> we have the Castle Milk Mort. So here's what it looks like. I'm just boiling up some water to uh, wash this up. And you can see there's a little bit of veggie matter and I'm not sure if that's scurf on the ends or not. We'll find out. But while we're waiting for the water to boil, let's have a little history lesson on the Castle Milk Morit. I have here, as usual, my fleece and fiber source book. Seriously, if you don't have it and you're a spinner, get it. It is the best thing ever. So, I have flipped to the Castle Milk Mort page, and there's what the sheep looks like. Now, what was really interesting about this is Sir Robert William Buchanan Jardine, who lived from 1866 to 1927, and he was a Scottish aristocrat whose family acquired its wealth through trading, he made his home at the family's Castle Milk Estate in Scotland, where his pastime was breeding animals, so hounds, cattle, horses, and sheep. One of his oddities as a breeder was that he was fascinated with breeding for shades of brown. An interesting obsession. He bred his sheep primarily to be beautiful lawn ornaments and named them for his estate, plus the term morit for their color. Morit, which means reddish-brown, is derived from the old Norwegian-influenced language of the Shetland and Orkney Islands. Essentially, it translate, translates to as red as the moors. So he used Morit Shetlands, Manx Lawtons, and Mouflon, a Mouflon ram to come up with an easy-care brown sheep with short, tight wool suitable for hand-spinning. So the Jardin family raised the breed until 1970 when it was dispersed. And in the 1960s, the Cotswold Farm Park was established and they acquired six ewes and a ram. And those are the foundation for all the Castle Milk Moritz today. The breed is known for high quality wool. And there aren't many Castle Milk Moritz so they can be hard to find. So I'm super excited that I have this sample to play with. So let's go over some of the facts. Their fleece weight is only two to three pounds, so they're not a terribly large fleece. Staple length is one and a half to three inches. So let's grab a staple here. So unstretched, it's about what, two inches? stretched we probably get to about it's got some serious spring to it it's got uh hold on there we go it's got a fairly loose crimp to it it's not terribly tight and the locks are kind of blocky but with the fine tips so they're not completely like a a down breed would just be fuzzy right across. These ones actually have little tips to them, which are quite nice. All right, so fiber diameters. According to the sources we located, it's listed as 30 to 35 microns. Our money's on the 29 to 32 micron range because both samples we sent to the lab tested even finer than that. So it can be quite like fairly fine almost next to the skin a castle milk mort fleece tends to hold together as a single unit from which the locks can be separated they are short blocky and often sun bleached at their outer edges they occasionally have slightly pointed tips which is what we have so they're light to medium reddish brown often with sunlight and tips that's what we got so dyeing, the fleece will accept dye, of course, but choose colors that will look good when over dyed on brown, obviously. 
The fleece is, short, fleece is short enough that most will want to be carded. It could be spun from loosened locks, handled like a short, moderately fine wool, most comparable perhaps to Manx Lockton. So knitting, crocheting and weaving, it's best for mid-range garments and fabrics like outerwear, sweaters, hats and blankets. It's best known for a very rare breed with a distinctive light brown fleece and coloring related to the wild mouflon, which to oversimplify means that the body is darker on its upper parts and lighter on the lower bits, including the neck and belly. All right, so that's the basics of the Castle Milk Moorit Fleece. So I am going to get washing. It feels not terribly heavy with lanolin, so probably uh, I'll do one tablespoon in the first bath, half a tablespoon, no, sorry, half tablespoon in the first bath, quarter tablespoon in the second bath, and then we'll rinse it. Um, if I notice anything unusual in the washing, I will pop in to give you an update, but otherwise, so you don't have to watch the boring washing process, um, I come back when it's all washed up and ready to be hung to dry. See you in a bit. So here we are, all washed up. It's nice and fluffy, very soft. There is a little bit of veggie matter in here. And again, it seems like there's a lot of sand. Now this looks like it could be scurf. I'm not positive, but we will find out as we process it. So I have my uh, netting here. Just going to tie cross corners, hook up my hangers and hang it to dry. So when that is dry, we will do the same thing with this we did with the soy fleece and we will take this castle milk moret and we will process it a bunch of ways in little samples and see what we like for this one. I expect every fleece to be a little bit different on what process works best with it, but I don't know for sure, which is why we're doing experiments. Dr. Chaos, mad fiber artist. All right, let me just adjust this one because I'm not clipping enough of that. There we go. Now I can go hang this in the bathroom or I can hang it by the fireplace and let it all dry out. So when it's dry, we will shoot the next portion of the video where we'll start to process it. So I shall see you then. All right, our Castle Milk Moret has dried. So we're going to free it from the net, do some prep work, and let's see how this one works out. So there is our fleece. Oh, it's a little damp in the middle still. That's all right, we'll use that part for combing. So first thing we're going to do we're going to take this area that's still a little bit damp. Grab my Luet mini combs, which I use for pretty much everything. And we're going to lash this on. Now this is like super short. See how short that is? But I'm going to comb it anyways because that's me. Once you stretch it out a little bit, I should be able to get just enough to be able to comb it. So just take it and stretch it a little bit and then we'll lash it onto the combs. Stretch it a little bit and we'll lash it on. Now, the reason I don't mind that this wool is a little damp is because combing, like, really brings out the static, like, super hard. So if it's a little damp still, 
it's not going to be as weak as if it was like wet but it should control some of the static Let's get to start. So we will just comb this out. Oh, it combs really easy. And we'll keep that to use. There's comb number one. Now it does look like it might have some little flakes of something in it, but let's see if they come out with the combing. They seem to be falling out. So whatever it is, I don't think it's scurf because that's generally really hard to get out. And this is just falling out. So dandruff maybe? I don't know. So there's combing number two. It is very soft and fluffy. And we're going to do one more just to kind of, so we're starting to pull from the butt instead of the tip. Oh, there's a little bit of debris in there. A little bit of VM. Now, here you can see in this piece the little biddies. So it doesn't really add up to a whole lot, and it seems to be just falling out. So I'm going to assume it's not scurf. All right. So we're just going to pull this off the combs. piece of debris to pull out there. All right, so there's some combed top. So we can spin a sample of that. Just tuck that in, leave the little tufts sticking out so we know which end to start from. Oops. It immediately jumped to the floor. All right, so that's our first. We combed up a little bit. Now we're gonna grab our cards which I didn't clean after the sewy fiber, silly me. All right, since we're doing breed specific and I want them very clean, I'm just gonna This is what I use to clean my cards. It's a hairbrush cleaning tool. You can get them, I think I've heard Walmart sells them. I got mine off of Amazon, but it is very useful. It'll get right down in there between the teeth on your cards and clean out everything. And it won't harm the teeth on your cards because those little metal tines will just move around the teeth. They're actually softer than the teeth on your cards. And there we go. Okay. So, I'm going to take a little chunk of sewy, or sewy, no, castle milk moret is what we're dealing with. I'm just going to 
pop that on a card and we're going to card this into a roll egg mesh the teeth then lift and pull mesh the teeth lift and pull i don't know who i saw that suggested this but it's actually been working really great for me so their suggestion is put the teeth together then slide so if your teeth gnash together that's fine just don't drag it through like that I should really get curved hand cards because I'm always using them like they are curved, even though they're not. All right. That was a crappy roll egg. But it is a roll egg. It's just a crappy one. So we'll add that to our prep and I'm going to make another roll egg, but I'm going to attempt to make this one a little bit better. I can't do it with quiet teeth. It just doesn't work for me. like it'll make a much better roll egg. There we go. And there is a little seed shell right there. I'm just going to pluck that in. That is a much nicer roll egg. So there we go. We've got comb top roll egg. Now we're going to Do some pitch locks. And, oh, I still have some over here. I'm going to pick some of these, too. Now, um, instead of pre-flicking my locks, I'm just going to flick them at the wheel. So that'll be our fourth prep. And I'll just do that at the wheel. So I'm just basically making this into a cloud. And that's allowing a ton of debris to just fall right out. The light sandy debris. I could spend all day just doing this, just picking locks. I just find it so soothing. So, we have some pick locks, we have some comb top, and we have one really crappy roll egg and one decent roll egg. And then we will also try flicking at the wheel. And we will do those four preps into a sample 
chain ply it back on itself, have a look and see what we like the best. I'll be back.